Hello, I'm Kimberly, and welcome to the weekend edition of the Native News Update. It's Friday, June 15th, and many of the stories you will hear here can be found at IndianCountryNews.com. Here's the news for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. John Yellowbird Steele, chief of the Oglala Sioux Tribe, says the Internal Revenue Service is failing to recognize Native American sovereignty by trying to tax government-funded benefits the tribes provide their members. Steele and other tribal officials were among witnesses testifying before the Senate panel June 14th on the possibility that the IRS may try to collect taxes on government-funded benefits given to tribal members and per capita trust payments. Steele says the IRS has been auditing several tribes and asking for documents on aid such as housing assistance, school clothes, and burial assistance. An IRS official says in prepared testimony that to be excluded from taxes, benefits and payments, payments must be made under a government program, promote the general welfare, and not represent compensation for services. Gladys Wittes of Aquana, Massachusetts, a longtime Native American leader, noted potter and tribal historian who led the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead for many years, passed away at the Martha's Vineyard Hospital on June 13th. Gladys was president of the tribe from 1978 to 1987. During her tenure, the tribe acquired the Gayhead Cliffs, the Cranberry Bogs, and Herring Creek from the town, and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead won federal recognition from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. In addition to her artwork and island tribal activities, she traveled the country attending Native American gatherings as a representative of the Wampanoags. She was born at a home in Gayhead on October 26, 1914, the daughter of William and Minnie Malonson. Donations in her memory may be made to the Aquana Cultural Center, 10 Blackbrook Road, Aquana, Massachusetts, 02539. On June 11th, descendants of the Sioux and Cheyenne warriors who defeated George Armstrong Custer and his 7th Cavalry gathered at Deer Medicine Rocks near what is now Lame Deer, Montana to celebrate the sacred site's new status as a National Historic Landmark. David Harrington, acting superintendent at nearby Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument, told about 200 people gathered for the ceremony that Deer Medicine Rocks' new status ranked it beside the Alamo, Mount Vernon, and the Empire State Building as one of the nation's most important historic sites. Only 2,500 sites are so honored, he said. That seems like a lot, but there are 87,000 sites on the historic site list. It is only one of only 3% so honored. The National Park Service oversees sites designated as historic landmarks. The process of getting Deer Medicine Rocks certified as a landmark took years and Northern Cheyenne and Lakota Sioux worked with the Park Service to designate the rocks based on their relationship to the Great Sioux War of 1876 through 1877. Did you know that the rattlesnakes are the traditional guardians of Deer Medicine Rocks? And that if they're waiting for you, at least one of your group should have stayed at home? Anywhere else, the rationalist answer would seem obvious. But the Deer Medicine Rocks, which erupt two stories into the sky from a hillock on a private ranch right next to the Cheyenne Reservation, can make the most hardened skeptic wonder. Here, on one of the disregarded back roads of the Native American byways, is history. Down one side of the rocks, a crooked cobalt streak has been scorched by an ancient lightning strike. Around the foot are carvings left by centuries of worshippers, soldiers, and travelers. And it was here in 1876 that the Lakota chief Sitting Bull had a vision of soldiers tumbling into his camp and carved his script into the stone. The figures, though a little faint, are very visible. Not long after that, not far from here, at a place history remembers as a little bighorn, the men of General George Custer's 7th Cavalry played their parts as predicted. The rock has powerful medicine. It's like putting the same poles of two magnets together. And the landowner, whose family has ranched this property for more than a century, is scrupulous about letting local Cheyennes pray at the rocks.
Crazy Horse Memorial is kicking off a series of free weekly programs. The lectures and performances begin at 6 p.m. every Thursday and will feature Native American groups or individuals. The weekly programs will run through August 30th. Admission is free for people attending the program who bring three cans of food or money for the memorial's food drive. For more information, you can visit crazyhorsememorial.org. A six-ton boulder covered in Aboriginal engravings is finally being returned to the BC interior, bringing closure to a First Nations community whose territory it was taken from nearly 90 years ago. The petroglyph-covered rock, which is carved with images of serpents, deer, and elk, was uncovered along the Fraser River by a gold prospector in 1925 and moved to Vancouver Stanley's Park a year later. A rash of vandalism in Stanley Park in the early 1990s prompted the park board to move the rock to the Museum of Vancouver in 1992, where it sat gathering moss and lichen until this past Tuesday when the rock was transported back to Churn Creek after a two-year repatriation effort. The rock's 500-year-old engravings were connected to the First Nation of Churn Creek, and on June 12th, industrial movers arrived early at the museum with overhead cranes and forklifts to remove the rock from the courtyard and take it back to the interior. The artifact will not be returning to its original location along the Fraser River due to concerns about its safety. Instead, it will find a new home upriver in the Churn Creek protected area where it will be accessible to the public. Micheline Bigman, a civilian employee at the Pueblo Chemical Depot, has received the Society for American Indian Government Employee Department of Defense Meritorious Award. Bigman, an Iraq War veteran, is an administrative assistant for the Emergency Service Directorate at the Depot and was honored for her work promoting Native American women veterans. A member of the Crow Nation, Big Man served two tours in Iraq Freedom and identified a need for women soldiers returning home. Her nonprofit organization, Native American Women Warriors, works with other groups such as Warriors in Recovery, finding resourcing assistance programs for Native American women veterans on reservations in urban districts needing health, education, and employment assistance. Native American Women Warriors also performs color guard duties in Indian regalia and has performed throughout Colorado in the Southwest and at the National Veterans Day Parade in New York City. You can learn more about Micheline's nonprofit by searching on Facebook at Native American Women Warriors. Ngajuwanung Fourth Annual Umbe Ojibwe Moda Language Camp will be held on June 21st through the 24th at Giwain's Campground in Sawyer, Minnesota on the Fond du Lac Ojibwe Reservation and it's free and open to the public. The camp will include hands-on cultural learning and traditional arts activities that people of all ages can participate in. At each station, there will be a fluent Ojibwe speaker and translator. For more information, you can call Jim or Pat Northrup at 218-878-0245, or you can find them on Facebook by searching Ngajiwanong Ojibwe Language Camp. And that's another roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me and have a grand day.